be talking about Ray Smith from Portland Line Company. We do have a couple more lunch lectures coming up. One is August 3rd and the next is August 10th. August 3rd is going to be Mary and Carl Kimberly talking about the New York Central College at McGraw. And the August 10th one is Chip Jeremy who will be talking about the Portland Traction Company. Thank you for coming and enjoy the show. Thanks, Tabitha. You're welcome. Please start by uh, thanking her for all her help uh, and giving me a little, some documents and things to help me track down this story. Uh, these two books were very helpful that I wrote from the uh, I read through them each looking for details on Portland Line and was sort of surprised there's not a lot in here. Probably because for quite a few years I've kind of been a silent observer of this historical society and it's taken me a while to understand that uh, being silent isn't always very helpful. <laughs> so if we think about things, we have a good idea, thinking about it doesn't really do anyone any good. It's kind of a waste of thought. So uh, I thought about Ray Smith who uh, founded this company. And before we turn the clock back a uh, hundred years, uh, I'll try to kind of explain what my interest is in this. About uh, April 19, there we go, April 1976, I was between jobs and my dad came to me and he said, I was talking to Dick Sanders at Rotary and he said they might have a position for a technician down there at the Clinton Line Company. So I said, okay, I'll go talk to him. So I went down to Clinton Line. I met a fellow by the name of Pete Scala. And he talked excitedly about these grading machines. And he said, now DuPont's come out with something new. It's called Fiber B. And we're going to take this new high strength fiber and put it on the graders. And we're going to make some fantastic things. Fiber B was invented by Stephanie Kowalik, uh, a woman at DuPont, and by the end of the year they coined the term Kevlar for this new fiber. And we began making cables. And uh, so that's kind of where my career began in the cable business. Then an interesting thing happened. I got a call one day. Uh, I'd been less than a year at the, at the Portland Line Company. And the father of a friend of mine called me up and he said, I'd like to take you out to lunch. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. No one's ever taken me out to lunch. <laughs> He's the father of a classmate. His name was Art Lorel. So we went, we had lunch, we finished eating. He looked me in the eye and he said, Doug, I'd like to give you some advice. He said, whatever you do, don't fall in love with the company. I said, okay. But I wasn't really sure what he was telling me or why. 38 years later, in March 2015, I was jilted. Again, I was between jobs. And I thought, well, last time I was between jobs, I went to Cortland Mine and I found a home. So, like the prodigal son, I went back to Cortland Mine. They welcomed me back. And uh, now I'm back there for the past, uh, not quite a year now. So I'd like to uh, kind of share something about, you know, I had an interest in what is this company that's kind of given me a home twice in my life. How did it start? How did it last over 100 years? And so the story kind of begins with this gentleman, Ray Smith. Ray Smith, back, he was born in 1875 when uh, Ulysses Grant was our president. By the time he was 30, he was uh, running a clothing store and Teddy Roosevelt was president. And I can imagine uh, Ray and his wife Mabel reading the Cortland Standard after dinner, talking about Teddy Roosevelt, 
and that crazy daughter of his, he had a daughter, Alice, who was uh, a bit of a scandal because she smoked in public. And now, 100 years later, that's getting to be a scandal again. <laughs> and Alice, she was a real cut up. She had, she had this cushion and she had it embroidered with this little saying that said, if you can't think of anything nice to say about someone, come sit by me. <laughs> and I can't help but think if Donald Trump were alive that day, he'd have plopped right down on the set. <laughs> yeah. So Ray was born in Akron, New York. And he had, uh, by the age of 30, he had three clothing stores. One in uh, Milwaukee, another one, let's see where were they? One in Milwaukee, one in Portland, and one in Western New York. Oh, I couldn't read this. Okay. His, uh, he lived at 81 Tompkins Street. I rode by my bike the other day and I took a picture. And then as I'm re researching historic uh, buildings in Cortland, I find this uh, little write-up on 81 Tompkins Street. So it's still there after over 100 years. And Ray would walk to work at 49 Main Street where he had his clothing store, oops, called the Motto. And he made fine, he sold fine clothing made out of mostly cotton and some silk. And uh, he had a wife and two daughters, and he was around this business, and on the weekends he would go fishing. Now if you look at this picture this, of the uh, store on Main Street, parked in front were all these horse and buggies. So back in these days, we didn't have any nylon or polyester or uh, new modern fibers. When he wanted to go fishing, he would pull the hairs from the tails of the horse. And they could be up to two or three feet long. And he'd carefully tie them together until it was long enough to make a fishing line to put in the water. And this got to be kind of tedious. So at some point he said, well, we're using all this fiber silk to make our dress shirts, and uh, maybe that's a better idea for the fishing line. So he ordered from his, from the uh, companies that were building, manufacturing his clothing, he got some raw silk, twisted it up into lines, and then he bought himself a braider. It's an interesting machine, because you can take like eight strands of this very fine yarn, and weave them together and make a rather robust cord to be used for fishing. You know, it's very tiny and very thin. So he began making these fishing lines, and Ray belonged to the odd fellows. So when he was traveling, or he'd be going to uh, check with suppliers for these fine shirts and things, he would bring along this fishing line and he would hand it out. And he'd go to the odd fellows' meetings and say, hey, try some of this fishing line. And pretty soon there was a demand growing for this stuff. And so he needed a place to do this, and he rented a corner of what was the Cortland Wagon Company. Now, the Cortland Wagon Company began around 1872. They made like 500 wagons in a year, and the next year they doubled it, and then they doubled it until they were making like 12,000 wagons to pull behind a horse. Well, about this time, uh, Henry Ford had come out with the horseless carriage, and the market for carriages to go by a horse kind of went the way of the horses. And pretty soon we had an empty building here. Uh, so Ray Smith rented a corner of the building, brought in the braiders, and started doing his braiding there. He was actually uh, leasing it from the Whitwire people. So right up until the 1960s. Now there, there weren't a lot of 
things on the internet about Ray Smith, but we did find uh, the census to be kind of a useful uh, resource. If you look here, we've got, you can probably can't see it from there, but we've got Ray Smith and his wife Mabel, and this was 1910, yeah. He's got a daughter, Catherine, one year old, and a daughter, Margaret, zero years old. Margaret was born in 1910. And then we have this Luverna Forshi, unrelated, 57 years old, listed as servant. So with two babies in the house, we can imagine what Luverna was doing with most of her time. Over the years, uh, they developed new uh, methods for making fishing line. Uh, Ray would meet with Mr. Potter, the Potter Paint Company, to get coatings put on the line to help them float. And they would occasionally get patents on their technology to uh, make sure someone didn't steal their ideas. When the U.S. entered uh, World War I, many of the fishing line braiders were diverted to making sutures because they found this silk braided, very fine cord was uh, kind of the best thing for sutures. It didn't absorb body fluids, and the surgeon's knot wouldn't slip in the material, so there was a lot of production in that. Then when World War II came, uh, they diverted a lot of production into making parachute cord because we had paratroopers going over to Europe and every parachute, as you can imagine, has many, many cords and there are many parachutes, so we uh, sort of diverted away from the fishing line production to make parachute cord for between 1942 and 1944. And the business kept building, hiring more people until 1943, I found this to be an interesting document. If you look at this, it was a vote between Portland Line and the United Steelworkers. Because at this point, there were 540 eligible workers at Portland Line. It's hard to imagine, 540 people. They took a vote, 471 showed up to vote. Some were voided ballots. But at the end of the day, 222 voted for the union, 233 voted against. And the management, you might say, dodged a bullet at that time. And they were never able to get the union in it with the line company. Now, two of the, two of the biggest uh, personalities to kind of help grow the business of the line were these two fellows, Leon Chandler, and Dick Jennings. I like to call him the ambassador and the artist. Leon came to Portland Line at about, in, uh, I think, 1941. He learned the art of fly fishing and taught it to everyone he knew and uh, went to national fishing shows, gave demonstrations. Pretty soon this caught the attention of the State Department and Leon ended up going all over the world to uh, share this fly fishing uh, enthusiasm he had with other countries. I found this. We had a big stack of old newsletters. They used to put out a newsletter every week. This is back in the 40s when uh, Leon got married. He went off to a honeymoon in Canada and he came back and they had stocked his desk all full of hard to get food because many foods were rationed in those days. So his fellow employees kind of donated some of uh, <coughs> the food they'd gotten uh, as a surprise when he got back. Here's another picture of Leon with Ted Williams. He met a lot of personalities. This is kind of an interesting picture where he's showing the Empress of Japan how to uh, cast a fly line. So wherever he went, he sort of carried the Cortland name and became well-known all over the country. 
and the world. And today we still export wine to uh, other countries. At Dick Jennings, he was the artist, very talented. He did oil paintings that were hung in the Portland Library, the way uh, current artists have paintings. He retired in 1977, and this was his classic signature. He would put at the bottom of a letter whenever he wrote a letter. So I uh, was kind of interested in what happened to the descendants of these two. <clears throat> it turns out that Neon lived at one Glen Street. Dick Jennings lived at five Glen Street, so they were neighbors. Neon had two boys, Tom and Kim, and Dick Jennings had five children. So I'm reading through the obituaries, trying to figure out what happened to these people, and I found one of Dick Jennings' children still lives in Cortland, not too far from the Cortland Mine Company. So I wrote her a letter. Her name's Pat O'Rourke, and she was quite pleased to hear from me. And uh, I was asking if she had any, you know, historical things that might add to this story. And if she has a sibling in Rochester who had kind of the archives from Dick's time at Portland Line, and she's uh, agreed to get those sent back to Portland so that I can kind of add to the story. And as I'm going through all these um, Portland Line newsletters, I can find this. Here's Art Laurel, the man that warned me about falling in love with the company. And I'd like to read this to you. It says, we welcome Arthur Laurel as our new plant manager. Art comes from Cory, Pennsylvania, where he served as chief industrial engineer at the Aero Supply Manufacturing Company. That's the company that bought Portland Line from Ray Smith in 1958. Art is a family man, having two girls, two boys, ranging from 14 to 6. And we were interested to learn that it was once associated with the Chicago Opera Company. Now, Art joined our church, and he was a tenor singing in the choir. And, uh, Quite a guy. Mr. Laurel has an engaging personality, and it is observed that he has the faculty of making friends easily. Please welcome him to Portland Line. So now I find out what he was talking about when he was at Portland Line. I, I found all the old um, board meeting minutes. They talked about getting into extrusion, where you make the, the classic monofilament fishing line, and the chairman of the board said, well, I told Art Lorelli he ought to learn up on that, but he didn't bother to go visit anybody. So I have a feeling that maybe he left court in line before he was ready, and uh, probably broke his heart. In fact, here in the minutes, and this is interesting, said Mr. Wood and Mr. Lorelli uh, been instructed to investigate suitability for Portland purposes. Uh, Two-story building in Portland, because uh, you're talking about moving. And then Mr. Margulies, this fellow in New York City, advised that many offers were available from cities in southern Illinois, Tennessee, Missouri, to build plants to Portland specification and sell them to the corporation on 30-year terms. And he pretty much said it's just as easy to move across town as it is to move to another state. So this was 1960. They're talking about leaving town. And I think the same considerations come up over the years, but Portland stayed here. And here was the sentence, let's see. Mr. least commented that a learning curve of considerable duration was known to be involved in the operation of the extrusion equipment purchased last year, and that his suggestion for shortening the curve, particularly with reference to visiting others in the field and learning the technique, had not been implemented by Mr. Leroux. 
she wasn't doing what the board had suggested. So yesterday, after all this, I sent a letter to Jim because I had found his mom's obituary, gave me a lead on where he was living. Then with the internet, I was able to get his address. So I sent him a note about this whole situation. And yesterday, in the mail, came this letter. Where he says, I'm pleasantly surprised to get your letter. I read a blast from the past. Glad to hear your mom is still alive. She made the best beef stroganoff I ever had. <laughs> Please send her my regards. And then at the bottom, he says, it's amazing that you're working at Corporal My Company. My dad loved it there and hated it there. He taught me to fly fish at a very young age. He was in Cortland Line, and it's still one of my favorite hobbies today. I still use that line and plan on fishing a lot when we retire to Hilton Head. Right now, I do most of my fishing in trout streams in West Virginia, because the trout fishing isn't too good here in Ohio. <laughs> so that sort of closed the loop on my story. With all of that, when did they move to River Street? <clears throat> well, Portland Line was on Court Street and they moved to Kellogg Road. I was working at Cortland Line until from 76 to 80 when Cortland Cable was formed. Cortland Cable set up shop on Fort Watson Street and then in 1995 moved to River Street. So Cortland Cable began as a division of the line company but then became totally separate in 1981. Would you consider yourself a fifth criminal? No, I'm a pretender. <laughs> but I should. Doug, this is Tom Jennings. This is Dick's son. Oh. Came all the way from Florida. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for the nice talk. I've got the book that you're looking for. My sister sent it to me last week. Good one. He was quite a guy. <clears throat> What's the present status of the company? Yeah, the company went through some shaky times. They were bought in 2012 by a group of investors, and there might have been six or eight. And then in 2014, one of the primary investors bought out the secondary investors. So now it's owned by the Wilson Group. John Wilson, who's a fly fisherman of national fame and has won awards, John Wilson is our president, where we sit in the Wilson Sporting Goods Factory, which is kind of that interesting. Wilson. Yeah. So the Wilson's back. But yeah, over the years they had a tennis racket business that the husband of one of Ray Smith's daughters ran. For a while, they made a, a steel racket head with little loops for the string with the braid. They couldn't quite get the brazing to work and they didn't have the money to invest, so they sold that racket to Wilson's. That became what they called the T2000, one of their more successful tennis racket products. So, how many employees are there now? Now we're down to about 40. Do you make more than just fishing line then, or was, do you still make cable for...? There's a few small braids that we make. At one time, they had, a, in the, between uh, 2000 and 2010, they had acquired a route company, a real company, and fly, tied fly company, and tackle box company, and they kind of overextended themselves because these other companies 
were not that profitable. Kind of sinking on their own weight, so they had to divest all that and, and to go back to the making of fly lines, which is the key uh, money maker. It's still the best fly line in the world. Yeah. Question to ask. Yeah. 